Off the bat, Jim, let me just say, I know that anyone should be wary of people claiming to represent the collective interests of people anywhere, uh, let alone claiming to represent the interests of a faceless army of anonymous people on the internet. So that that one off the bat off the bat I understand that. But we are staring now at a transhumanist bio terror laden operation in the face with a cyber pandemic on deck. If there was ever a time I believe that a group like anonymous would be you know would be such a much welcome wild card into the the uh into the scenario where the chips were down and anything like that I thought it would be a time like now especially since cyberspace has been telegraphed to be the next big domain for the next big catastrophe but I feel that if we don't get silence altogether then we just get psychos like that Aubrey Cottle freak doxing actual peaceful protesters or, you know, little people, average people who emptied their piggy banks in hopes to keep democracy alive. What the hell happened to Anonymous? So, first and foremost, Anonymous started for the lulls. I mean, it was, it was, you know, the Wild West on the Internet still, um, there weren't very many laws to protect anybody from anything. And there wasn't this massive data collection machine and censorship machine going on. So, I mean, the Internet was freer back in 2008. Okay? We're going to start there. And, um, you know, I, of course, gravitated immediately to this because I was already an Internet relay chat IRC junkie. Um, I've been a hacker my entire life. Um, it just seemed to fit, you know, it seemed like trolling with a purpose. Um, and for those who don't know, um, the origins of, uh, of anonymous, um, the website 4chan and there was other webs, there was a website before that. Um, <laughs> Um, but basically 4chan really solidified anonymous because if you go onto 4chan and you post and you don't have a username, your name is anonymous. Um, so posting on 4chan, of course your IP address is right there. Um, which is why I suggest to everybody, you know, get a VPN because you never know when you're going to hit enter and then magically your computer's phone number. It's going to be right there on the internet, and of course, people prey on that. Um, but the the general origins of anonymous were just, I mean, like trolling video games and trolling Fox News and trolling all kinds of random stuff. Um, you know, pretty much every joke you can think of lately came from the armpit of the internet, which is 4chan. The OK symbol, 4chan. Um, Every mass media outlet will tell you that's a symbol of white supremacy. Started as a joke on 4chan. People believed it. Um, but then it started to morph. And, you know, especially with the Scientology movement, um, you know, people started to troll the Scientologists because the Habo Hotel had been shut down. We couldn't close the pool anymore. And um, this is when people started to realize that this, you know, amalgamous collective could make, affect real world change that us digital cyber junkies that and, and and for a clarification, most of the people who were in anonymous aren't hackers. They're not even really computer savvy. They just like to troll and they enjoyed the lulls. Um, so I would I would you know venture to say probably one in a hundred people who claim to be anonymous are actually hackers. Um, and that's a common misconception. And it's probably closer to one in a thousand, but regardless. Um, so Anonymous started from this place of joy and laughter and just free internet, have fun, do as thou wilt. Ooh, that's kind of harsh. Um, and, it, and it slowly morphed to hacktivism. And for me, you know, honestly, up to that point in my life in 2008, I didn't really have political opinions. I just – if you asked me my political opinion, it would be fuck politics. Um, 
and I didn't really weigh it into much of what I, I you know, I did as it relates to, you know, being around these people. But then it morphed really quickly. And from about 2010 to 2012, that's when was, I would say, the heyday, you know, like the marquee, um, you know, a non hacks occurred. And this simultaneously occurs with a solar maximum, which is not um, too surprising because. As we re- reach into a solar maximum, people get more excited, they're more irritable, um, they have more energy, and those are the times of greatest revolution. So it was kind of understandable that so much was volatile and so much was changing at such a rapid pace during that time. Um, during this time, we saw the advent of Lulz Sec, L-U-L-Z-E-S-E-C. And it's um, cohort anti-sec. Um, and during this time, you know, I was more in the anti-sec club, you could say. I knew members of LulzSec. They were a small clique. But that's kind of how anonymous is. There's multiple. What, what, what would be the, the, the differentiation between the two? LulzSec was a, was a small, tight-knit group of very, very high caliber hackers an anti-sec would be a more broad umbrella that many people could fall under and of course this all derives from the term infosec for which is the hashtag infosec for information security so information security is an oxymoron as we can clearly see, you know, by all of the numerous hacks that have occurred over the years, from the biggest, from the smallest individual to the biggest banks, um, you know, there there's very few things that cannot be penetrated, and that was uh, quickly shown. Um, an example: a gentleman by the name of Geo Hot went and um, he thought it was a good idea to take a PlayStation. And he realized that he could run Linux on a PlayStation. So he took that, that, that PlayStation, he hacked it, and he went and put a copy of Linux on it so that you could use your PlayStation as a personal computer so that you could do word processing, you could browse the Internet, and you didn't have to play pay PlayStation to be a part of the PlayStation network. So PlayStation sued him. And that pissed off Anonymous because, as we say, (laughs) we are a legion. We do not forget. We do not forgive. Expect us. And PlayStation learned this the hard way to the tune of about $2.1 billion worth of damage when Anonymous hacked the PlayStation Network. Then along comes Julian Assange. And this is probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest, hack. Um, Julian Assange comes along, WikiLeaks occurs, um, Bradley slash Chelsea Manning dumps all this data. And immediately it comes to our attention that the United States government is using defense contractors to attack American journalists like Glenn Greenwald, which is kind of the precursor to what we're seeing today with, you know, this entire um, military media industrial complex attacking political enemies in, you know, lockstep. Um, and what happened was H.B. Gary, Palantir, and Barrico Technologies, these are defense contractors, were targeting Glenn Greenwald and anybody associated with Julian Assange. And the guy from H.B. Gary who wrote the super root kit or the boot kit, he wrote the, the, the malware that can live on your motherboard that even if you take your hard drive out and you put a new one in and reinfects it, um, 
go back on my YouTube channel. Um, you can go to connect.climateviewer.com. You'll see it. And, um, and you can actually see that I had a boot kit on my on my computer i had to build an entire new computer replacing the bios didn't even work um so he got to run in his mouth and he said that he was going to dox anonymous at which point a 16 year old girl from anonymous hacked hb gary and dumped all of their databases on the internet including like all their freaking emails I, to this day, still have all those emails. I read them every now and then for just lulls. Um, and this was an inside glimpse into the defense contractor world of all of these politicians, military officials, and this defense contractor colluding to make you know software that allows the government to spy on you, the government to spy on Glenn Greenwald, a journalist, all of this should be illegal, but it's national security. LulzSec literally had their 50 days of lulls, and they were live on Twitter, and they were taking requests, you know, tell us a website you want deleted from the Internet. And, um, you know, of course, I called their live show. They literally had a freaking 800 number. And I called them. They're like, what's up, dog? And I said, what's up, little sec? Um, can you give me some Finn Fisher? And they said, did you say Finn Fisher? I said, I said Finn Fisher. And they took out Finn Fisher. He's like, check it. And I hit F5, and the website was gone. Now, Finn Fisher is a British defense contractor that sold the software to Muammar Gaddafi that he used to spy on his citizens to go and kill them. And this is the revolt. This is the, the sickest part of the InfoSec world is that defense contractors and military-grade um, hacker groups are literally selling the same software to dictatorships in Iran, in China, in North Korea. They sell this software so they can track every single activist out there. They work in collusion with Facebook and Twitter and Google because they want to be part of these markets, especially China. And between all of these things, it, whatever Facebook won't give them, there's a defense contractor out there that's written a, you know, a software that will mimic Facebook. And then these activists think they're talking to each other, and they're all safe, and they're planning their protest, and they all get killed in the middle of the night. This is disgusting. So, you know, of course, when I called Lulsec, I said, Finn Fisher, why not? Um, and this is the kind of stuff that, you know, would go on on the regular. They, they hacked Stratford. They hacked all of these big name, you know, defense contractors, um, police, um, you know, all kinds of things until the day Sabu, who was one of the leaders of LulzSec was arrested by the FBI. And this was, you know, circa 2011 and, by 2012, he had he claims he didn't. Um, Hector Monsor um, claims that he didn't turn in the members of Lulzsec, but he was working in an FBI office to hack foreign governments to do the bidding of the FBI. They literally had him working as a digital slave hacker, and that brought about the demise of you know. A friend of mine, Topiary, um, the other leader of Lulzsec, Commander X, and you know everybody went to jail, and that really sent a chill through all of Anonymous. Now the anti-sec movement it carried on a little longer, um, but up to this point, you know there was really like two camps in the Anon world. You had the guys who did it for the lulls. They they went and they violated websites. They defaced websites. Um, Got to be very careful about what I say. <laughs> um, but, you know, like defacing the CIA website, I wouldn't know anything about who did that. Um, and 
at the same time, there were these other people who really wanted to bring about change, like epic change. And I know this is going to fly well with some people, but this is the terminology used because I like to give people accurate information. There were the lulls, and then there were the moral fags. And this is just, if you went to um, the undernet and you joined the internet relay chat and you went to the channel Anani Ops, you would probably fall into one of those two camps. So the way Anonymous worked was basically you would have operations. And it wasn't like there was a big vote or anything. Nobody has a card. Nobody had a membership. You know, there were no leaders. If anybody like this, this uh, Aubrey um, moron claiming to be the leader of Anonymous, no, Aubrey was one of the original 4chan trolls. He ended up making 420chan because he just didn't feel like he fit in anymore and basically talked about wrestling and porn, you know, and smoke weed. So he made his own website and, and kind of broke away from the group because, you know, there was no Habo hotel. The pool did not have AIDS and it just wasn't as fun. To, I mean, for him to be claiming to be the, the world's greatest hacker and founder of anonymous is laughable. Um, I don't care how many interviews he gets. Um, but it was basically the, the idea that you could come to this you know, collective spot, have an idea, and if the idea was good enough, an operation was formed around it. And one of the things that Aubrey said um, was that he's taken down pedophiles. I, too, was a part of that op that was called Op Death Eaters. And the idea was real simple. You came into the internet relay chat. You said, hey, you know what? Why don't we, you know, since we've been, you know, really kicking Scientology's ass, why don't we do some good in the world and use the powers that we have to hack these websites where these pedophiles are hiding on the Tor network, on I2P, dump their databases, out them to their families, all of these things. And from that sprung op death eaters. Um, another op was, you know, op PayPal. Whenever WikiLeaks um, was basically denied its funding from PayPal and MasterCard, um, they got hacked. So this is very similar to what's going on today with GoFundMe and the gifts and Go. Um, you know, back in the day, this all the history repeats itself. Those who forget, but it's, the past inver but it's inverted. It. But it's a, it's an inver it's an inverse now. And I guess that's right. a, that's so that so the now. And I love all this 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 backstory and this history here. So let me just let me just nudge you into another direction by using this Aubrey guy as a uh, as as a uh, a, a segue. Um, here is a person who seems very very confident. Now, obviously. If you're a known, if you're an asset to somebody, and uh, and the people who are doing threads on, the, I, I sent you the thread on him, and the people who are doing threads on him and known associates that uh, at, that were all working for at least for a long time, the CIA or continue to, um, as I said in the opening here, we've been covering these these stories for over ten years now. That uh, you know that Guardian. That Guardian story that I sent you that's over 10 years old, talking back then that one in four hackers are FBI informants. And when you think about what the, I mean, there's there's nothing else that we can deduce from the political intentions and objectives of some of these bureaus and agencies based on what they have been involved in, what they have uh, suppressed as far as, um, you know, political espionage with the Russia, Russia thing and everything else. Uh, we, we can deduce a lot about what their goals are domestically and around the world. And the fact that you have some of these, these, uh, these people that go out there and are just so blatant and so brazen and so uh, proud of what they've done to go after little tiny commoners in in uh, in in Canada for for wanting to protest a techno fascist 
revolution or coup d'etat that is really creeping around the world, it makes me wonder, well, what the hell? I mean, where are there any moral fags left? Uh, and, and where are we right now? If, if, these, if this is how confident that evil can be, they have to think that they're plugged into something bigger that protects them. You know, it, it, it's, it's ironic. And I'll give you an example. Um, so the reason I left, the reason I packed, you know, pulled up my pants and said, this party's getting dirty, I'm getting out of here, um, is because I realized that I was being used. That the ideology didn't fit with my own moral fiber. And I realized this during the Arab Spring. And for you know, for all it's worth, when it was happening, the idea was op Arab Spring, we're going to free the Middle East from all these dictators. Sounds great on paper. Sounds great in an internet relay chat. And then the logistics start to happen. We got dudes literally flying planes, dropping flyers, giving dial-up numbers to satellite phones so that people can get their, get on the Internet and coordinate without being caught by their governments. Um, you know, I went in and I was running a, a program called Visual Route, and you could actually see the routes of how data flows through the internet. And what I realized was that basically everything in Benghazi, everything um, in, you know, every everything that Gaddafi had government-wise was basically flowing through one cable that ran under the Mediterranean. And that's how it got out to the rest of the world. So I quickly jumped in the 90 ops and I'm like, look, I found the weak spot and I dropped the IP address. Somebody immediately is like, yo, we hit up a private message. I said, here it is. Um, you know, do you have the firepower? He's like, yes, I do drop the IP. Bam. He's like, check it, checked it with a, you know, ping dead, dead in the water. We're both giddy. Okay. Start checking, you know, all of the the websites in, um, you know, and why can I not? I'm, I'm drawing a brain fart right now. What are you talking Bang about in Libya and Benghazi? In Libya, Libya. Thank you very much. So I start checking all the Libyan government websites. Down, not available. Down, not available. Down, not available. Like Twenty of down, not available. We're like, oh my god, I just hit the jackpot. Less than five hours later, he was dead. Who? Who? who Gaddafi? Yeah. So, so this, then, so this, so so what you're saying? Uh, this is this is pretty serious. What you're saying here? Yeah, it is, and it's something that, on the one hand, it's like you go, was you start to question everything immediately, and then for years. I had regret about this because I felt like, you know, th later on finding out, yeah, I mean, he was a dictator. And yeah, he did kill people. But everything's not as black and white as you'd like to think. And yeah, he was wanting to switch to a gold standard. Bankers don't like that. And he found primary water. And that is a problem. So was I a useful idiot? And that's what I asked myself. I don't think that a lot of people ask themselves, am I the useful idiot? And at that moment, I quickly, and you can go to archive.org and see this, resonated, became Jim Lee, became James F. Lee Jr. from Sumter, South Carolina with his name, his address, his phone number, all that on climateviewer.com and anonymous became a thing of the past. And the reason why is because it's real easy to kill resonated. It's much harder to kill James F. Lee Jr. from Sumter, South Carolina. Um, and like you were saying, you know, these government officials, we would joke about it. They would come into Anani Ops, you know, IRC. And I mean, we already knew. 
you know, like they would be on their on their VPNs, but they were already previously tracked. And I mean, they'd come in and, you know, the higher ups would be like, hello, Agent Thomas, welcome to the Nani Ops. Um, it's a running joke that the FBI shows up at DEF CON conventions and Black Hat conventions begging hackers to join the FBI, begging hackers to join the NSA, the CIA. Um, I even have an article from way back in the day on climateviewer.com, FBI willing to hire weed smoking hackers because they want them that desperately. They're like, look, I know weed's illegal, but we can't find a hacker who doesn't smoke it. So we'll take you even if you smoke weed. Um, and they would basically beg um, hackers to join. Um, and, of course, you know, now there's a whole new breed. Uh, you know, things have changed so much since 2012. Well, let me ask you something about that in 2012, because when when you put yourself, um, when you when you you tell this story and you put yourself right in the middle of this uh, this melting down out there in um, in, in Libya, how does how does the uh, the disabling of so-called government websites lead to the 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 death of the the leader of the the country? I mean, there is a lot of things. There are there are far more military. I mean, we we, we what we've learned about Benghazi is just there are so many layers to what was being done to the region that uh, I just don't see how the the disabling of these sites would would have led directly to. Uh, his well, death. It, it's a it's a cascading effect like once you lose the internet once you lose phone lines they lost all communications um like i talk about what's in the cup nikki <laughs> take a guess um i don't drink alcohol it's coffee um it's a cascading effect and without communication um you know the ability to keep intel reports flo um, floating in um there were there were people on the ground blocking radio frequency doing jamming there were people hacking all the things um so you know i can't you know take full credit for it or full blame um but i, I, I time, wouldn't want you to either i'm actually trying to find, i'm trying yeah. to find a way to i'm uh, yeah, trying to find a way to, to uh, and, and tr trust me i've wrestled with this for years but at the end of the day um i i feel like i was a useful idiot and i feel like i was played and that i believed a narrative and that gave me this righteous feeling and i where i'm going with this is i think that aubrey exemplifies that that if you believe a narrative enough and that you dehumanize your opponent to a certain point then you can justify any action against them does that make sense absolutely it does and I, I, that's where i assumed we were heading with this because right. i don't see i mean and, and let me just also say something um about this all i i have no problem with exposing corruption where it is even with policing jim like like there is more than enough reasons to criticize policing with things like civil asset forfeiture no knock raids those are at the top of the list um but when so-called anonymous zeros in on cases surrounding people like mike brown or like george floyd george like floyd they, i mean they that's... literally were hacking the police department and playing you know fuck the police see that it's obvious at that point it, it, when i hear that spirit. it's obvious at that point that these are these are leftist bolshevik types are directing all of this so-called hacktivism with their little laser pointer because if, if, if you if you really want to go out and and make it hard for corrupt police departments to function without being exposed that's one thing but to go for the mainstream media anointed uh stories that by and large were always uh, usually the fault of the deceased uh i mean almost always they were some of the worst examples to ever be held up and and people to be um to be lionized it was the worst thing there are plenty of things to go out there and to uh and, and to protest and and to try to bring about change but the fact that um this was going this goes on and it, it almost feels like they follow the the bolshevik laser pointer around which does not seem like a very independently thinking 
pro civil liberties libertarian kind of a, a group anymore it's got to be just an appendage of the state and 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 that's where i really you know started to question everything is that what i noticed was a trend what i noticed was why did wikileaks every single time target only american targets why did hack anonymous only target american targets almost exclusively aside from the air spring which was basically them doing the work of the american military industrial complex um why not china why not iran why not russia why why is all of this aimed right back at where i live and i had to ask myself that repeatedly and honestly you know i didn't know i didn't understand how deep that rabbit hole went until some time had passed um quick interlude so i put my name out there i go on youtube i try to make a little you know a little thing for myself i start talking about all the things that i've learned while delving all the armpits of the internet and um then i'm attacked by a group of youtubers and they basically attacked and harassed my family for a year and a half and it was a group of seven individuals some of which you may know the names of dutch sense montograph um to a lesser extent tattoo 1009 these are youtubers dutch sense has 500,000 subscribers, Tattoo, 100,000 subscribers, Monograph, 150,000 subscribers, making, and they had a friend named Agent19 who literally made 500 YouTube videos about me. They tweeted my police department 2,000 times that I was a pedophile. They called my boss. They called my family. They harassed me for a year and a half, and I had kind of put down the digital weaponry until I couldn't take it anymore. And at that point, I went and I hacked all seven of these sons of bitches, got their names, addresses, their phone numbers, and I did a six and a half hour Google Hangout where I showed their you know, Google Street View of the front of their house, all of this stuff. They didn't know who they were messing with. Um, but I had no other option because YouTube can be weaponized as well. YouTube does not have a phone number for you to call. There is uh, no one on the other end to save your ass. So they were using this October Reigns character to harass and intimidate me while still pretending to be anonymous. But, you know, as any internet sleuth or hacker worth his salt, um, you can go back and you can find anything from as far back as I, I, I watched original monograph videos before he was ever monograph agent 19 when he was here be monsters and all of this stuff. Um, Dutch since Michael Janich was so easy to dox at the end of the day, like I had to dox all of these people. And then after I had presented all of this overwhelming evidence, then they wanted to call me because I couldn't flag the videos fast enough to get them down. If I flagged a video, Agent 19 had 999 YouTube channels. So he would upload 20 more videos. Sure, I knocked one down, 20 more would come up. This has happened, this group claims to have taken out 100 plus activists like myself and made them quit YouTube and actually led to the death of one of the founders of 4chan who killed himself on Christmas because they cyber harassed him so hard. So long story short, they call me. They admit to everything. They say that they will you know, basically take down all 500 videos, including the fake websites they made about me and all of the, you know, black hat SEO stuff they did to ruin my SEO ranking on all my websites. Um, to this day, I'm still dealing with that portion of it. And I recorded that whole conversation and uploaded it to YouTube as well as a final farewell. Fuck you. Um, now, 
But what, 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 yeah, what, what, what's I, I see? I don't know any of these people, and I don't know. I, I just want how I just want to have the oh, to Chad knows them. <laughs> well, I, well, I know, I know um, Dutch sense. I, I watch his. I still watch his streams from time to time. I just don't know. Uh, you know, obviously, this sounds like a very. This is this is pretty serious. What what, what went on? Uh, what you're alleging? Uh, so I'm just wondering how it all ties in with. With the rest of this, because whenever I I had a friend of mine named Bill Nar, he's passed away. He was one of the writers on my website and a good friend. And um, he used to be a investigator for the FBI. And I said, you know, hey, I'm having trouble just on this monograph guy. Can you get me some information? And he told me that when he talked to his contacts at the FBI, that monograph was in the Federal Witness Protection Agency. And he was working for the FBI and that I needed to leave it alone. Which begs the question, because he's the one that started the whole fire. He's the one that got Dutch Sense fired up. He's the one that got you know, Agent 19 working side by side with him to do all of this. Now that I had outed myself, was the government targeting me? This is called an active persistent threat. We talked about this in the text. An active persistent threat is where you pick a target and then you use every tool in your arsenal over a long period of time to break them, to break their will, break them financially. Um, They are the hacker version of sociopaths. Um, They don't have any, you know, remorse for what they do. So at the end of the day, it took an overwhelming amount of force and pressure to make that problem go away. And there isn't a day that goes by that I don't think about, you know, the day I get to meet Agent 19. Dutch sense, I've forgiven. Even monograph, I've forgiven and I've moved on. But if I were to meet Agent 19 tonight... Um, it would be in the headlines. So this is this is the kind of world where you know, like most people don't, and, I, and I'm sure you've dealt with your share of threats. Um, when I went up to the EPA, people threatened my life; they were going to kill me. When I went to Washington D.C., this stuff happens all the time, and people use intimidation. You got this Aubrey prick over there going, "I'm not scared." Doesn't sound that way now. Um, He's crying on multiple websites that he's receiving death threats, and it's getting worse for him, and it's only going to get worse. Um, In this modern world, there are so many ways to reach out and touch somebody without ever doing it, and that's the scariest part of it. So you ask yourself, where are they today? And I go to the old hotspots, Anani Ops, you're a non news on Twitter, and I'm scrolling back. I'm just trying to figure out the tail of the tape. Where did it go so damn left? And then I'm looking with these brand new eyes going, it always was. And I'm looking at the Hillary Clinton Donald Trump election, and I'm watching your Anon News, official news source of Anonymous. I'm watching Anani Ops, Antisec, and all these people saying, Hillary Clinton better win. And I'm going, how can people who started out from a place of the Internet should be free, it should be uncensored, and data must flow, what was called data love back in the day, um, how can these same people support someone as wretched as Hillary Clinton and the people that literally spied on a sitting American president using the military industrial complex, it's not like they're stupid. I cannot believe that they're just stupid. They have to know. And and I see this, I watched the Aubrey video, I read his Reddit, I read all of his deleted tweets, I read everything about this guy. Um and I know a lot more than we could possibly pack into the next 30 minutes. Um, But the question remains, how could you be convinced that people who are trying to advocate for their freedom just don't tell me what to do with my body, my body, my choice. I don't want to take a vaccine, my choice. I don't want to wear a mask, my choice. I'm the one that's going to have to deal with it. Um. 
And at the end of the day, I, it just really comes down to, I think that tribalism takes over the brain and the reasoning portion of these individuals, or they're just, it's either that or they're paid to do what they do. Hmm. Period. Well, I, I, you know, it's, uh, it, it makes a lot of sense, Jim. Uh, as far as the, the psychological aspect of it and how one thing can be co-opted and influenced over a period of time, because we've just seen very, very drastic social uh, de-evolutions that have taken place just in the last 10 years. So uh, it's it's really not... So if something happens over the course of 50 to 70 years, sometimes it's a little bit more subtle. You you lose a lot of the details and a lot... But, you know, we've been almost like kneecapped and forced to watch this happen so quickly that um, it's a little bit more, it's not subtle. It's a lot more overt what's been happening. And uh, I really, man, this, this is one hell of a, one hell of a deep dive here. Um, uh, let me see. Well, I mean, this is eight, it's eight 30. I, I got to take an inter intermission and, and take some of these super chats here. Uh, I wanted to be ending around here. Have a, have had a full hour. We'd still got a good amount in, what would you leave us with, with 42 minutes on the clock right now that we've done together? Uh, what would you leave us with, any kind of words of uh, encouragement or, or a anything that you think would be a nice conclusion? A warning and a call. The warning would be that if if we don't get an equal and opposing action... If we don't get that force for good, for freedom version of Anonymous, then we're all in deep shit. Because right now, there is a resurgence of young kids who didn't grow up with the original ideals that Anonymous was founded on. Anybody can make an Anonymous video. The problem is they're never targeting the problem. The problem is the Don Lemons of the world. The problem is the FBI. The problem is a dirty DOJ. Um, when I see a group that is willing to take on those establishments, the powers that be, then I will start to smile like I did back in the good old days when Lulsec was just randomly targeting everything with the laser um, that anybody could download. If we don't have something to equalize the hacktivist world, we are doomed. I, I Listen, that is it's something that you don't even have to say at this point, and I, I mull over a lot in in private i mean like for example this the whole idea for this conversation right now just popped up in uh it, it all flooded to me thinking that well this this is what we're starting to see that what is bearing down on people in canada that have made their way to ottawa what has come on, down on them from a media end from a of course a a digital exposure end, a financial end. Not only are they being, are people being exposed and shamed and sought out in public, but they're having banking institutions close to them. Everything else. And I, I was saying, if this is the way that they're that the screws have been turned on us in a cyberspace kind of a uh, way, then what happens when the next war, the next phase of the war, which they constantly talk about, that cyber <laughs> cyber pandemic is coming? What the hell happens when the the next domain, the major domain of a a, a war that everybody's attention is going to be drawn toward, is there? It, I mean, if there's nothing, if there's nothing advocating for any anything other than the state desired outcome, then holy shit! I mean, that's just. <sighs> Hopeless. I mean, is somebody saying in chat Durham report, how about if there was a right conservative wing of anonymous of moral fags who decided, you know what, Durham is fighting an uphill battle. Who knows what he's actually going to come up with? Why don't we just go and break into Nancy Pelosi's emails and the Capitol Police's emails and get all of that internal document and footage and all of that and dump it? If that were to happen tomorrow, 
there would be no way to lie about it anymore. And that's the thing they're most scared of. They have to control the narrative. So infiltrating groups like Anonymous, that was a slow, painful process for, I'm sure, a lot of these old farts who did it, but they did it. Somebody's got to wake the fuck up and go, hacktivism is a necessary evil for good. And the anti-hero that was anonymous needs to bring back freedom. And sometimes the best disinfectant is sunshine. And the only way we're ever going to get that is not by asking or saying, you know, please, DOJ, tell us what you did last summer and the summer before. Literally going out there and getting it. They were the Internet's cowboys. We need some damn cowboys. Um, I would love, I will, and, and I want to just end with your own personal protection. One of the things that I learned from this whole experience, from you know my YouTube experience of being cyberbullied and all of that stuff, is that yes, like I said, I've long since forgiven um, Dutch Sense and Monograph. Um, but what I did learn from all this, and especially Aubrey, you know, even in his own Reddit, like they're literally talking about LastPass. What you guys have to do is protect your password. Password reuse is a sin. If you use the same password on more than one website, you will be hacked and all of your things will be broken. Um, so using something like LastPass, KeyPass, there's a couple other different ones, but basically you have a master password that you can log in. Make it something this damn long. And then, um, or look up the dice method for making passwords for your master password. And then after you do that and you log into LastPass, then when I go to a new website, I can generate a password that's 16, 20, 100 characters long with numbers and symbols and caps and, low ca and lowercase, all of that. And I just hit generate password, put it in the box, save, and I never have to remember it again. And that's going to protect you more than anything when it comes to if any of these websites you visit go and they get vulnerable, um, you know, get hacked. Um, somebody does a SQL injection, dumps their database, um, and then leaks it to the Internet. Then suddenly your password's out there. And if you have the same password on Facebook, and God forbid you have a YouTube channel, um, they're going to be able to get into all of your things. But if you have a good password protection if it's different on every single website you visit and you don't have to memorize them, priceless. Using a virtual private network to encrypt everything you do so that your internet service provider cannot sell your user data to other companies and just hand it over to the Department of Homeland Security Fusion Centers, to the local police, to the NSA, to the CIA. I use ExpressVPN. It's the fastest. It's encrypted. It's They have a zero log policy. Um, if you want a good VPN, you have to pay for it. Free VPNs, they're doing the same thing. They're selling your data. Um, so expressvpn.com slash climate viewer. If you guys want to get that, you can get three months free with my code. Um, and then finally, don't keep shit on your computer that you don't want people to see. It's simple as that. If you have some very personal photos and you have them on your phone, you might want to consider just printing those out and putting them in a book and then keeping them the hell off your devices because there is no such thing as a secure computer. There's no such thing as a secure phone. Given enough time, you will lose that information. Somebody will break into it. And it isn't that hard. They don't even have to be sitting at their desk to do it. Well, Jim, I, I have uh, for, as the uh, at, for my my laptop at home for my background image. It's a picture of me spreading my butt cheeks apart. Is that is that a problem? No, if you don't mind everybody seeing it. Okay, and my password is password one. Um, so. Whenever you're doing brute force attacks, um, that would take less than 60 seconds to, to crack. Um, it would be in the first row of the dictionary of attacks. Um, 
generally speaking, you want to make a password that is a sentence. So even use the spaces and make it something, you know, pick your favorite lyric from a song, change the S's to dollar signs, change the O's to zeros. You, you Be, you know, a little creative if you're going to have to remember this, but a much better way to do it is use a password manager your browser cannot store passwords securely the first target of a good hacker is going to be what's in your browser password manager because it takes like five seconds to crack and shit you can download it and then crack it later so you have all the time in the world um so the best thing you could do is use a password manager okay that's what I think. We have to, we have to do more of this. Um, we have to do more of these. I, I mean, this was such a big topic, and I'm glad that we got this because I know that you had some personal experience. Uh, we um, and it, it gives me so much more of an idea of of why we are why we've heard such a very odd amount of silence as uh, as people who are who are not plugged in to any major sources of, of political or social power structure or anything like that are being brutalized and exposed by a, a combination of media and those in the digital realm that are willing to expose everyday people. And, and this used to be the kind of efforts that were put forth to uh, to, to show that governments were, were were torturing people in war zones. And now it's it's to expose, you know, a gelato shop owners in, in Ottawa who just yeah. want to see mandates go away and um it's oh and, and they throw around stupid stuff like oh it's the proud boys or you know that gives and go is somehow a proud boys front website and just the, the amount of lunacy that's coming out of these people um it, it's sickening and like i want to be proud of something again i mean when i had when i got this i was proud of it you know what I mean? Like there, there was actually good stuff being done at one time, and it slowly got weirder and weirder, and it got more political, and and I, you know, it, it's like every single situation. Um, whenever the Bundy Ranch thing happened, and those farmers were out there fighting the U.S. government, there were forty people in the building, and of those forty people, nineteen were FBI informants. Because hmm. I met um, Bundy's son in person, shook his hand, and uh, when he told me that, I was like, it's just always the case. So if you try to make a difference in this world, know that your group will be infiltrated, and there will be influencers that will try to sway your group to use you or destroy you and that's what we're up against is that anonymous has been co-opted by far leftists who see you know people as inhuman i mean they're just the, the dehumanization aspect of this whole left versus right um you know i i will always say that I will vigorously defend your ability to be wrong and speak freely. I don't have to agree with you, but we should all agree that we should have freedom of expression and not be tracked, not be censored, not be literally silenced. Um, and I don't understand why so many of these far leftists like Antifa and you know cyber terrorists like Aubrey um, think the way they do. I can't, I can't understand it. Um, and the only thing I can think is that once you get into that tribal mentality, you're done. So that's what we all need to fight against. And hopefully Batman will reemerge and somebody who cares about truth, love, liberty, and freedom will replace what, what, what once was the greatest slogan ever, we are legion. Expect us. I, uh, I appreciate your time, as always, Jim, and thank you for uh, spending it with us tonight. And, man, I just wish we, uh, you know, obviously nothing we can do to go back and kick Skype in the in the nuts, but uh, we, we got it together here and we were able to salvage it. I'm, I'm happy for that. 
Well, it's partially my fault because, you know, you never know what Skype's going to do. It's it's Skype. I mean, the microphone has always worked with Skype before. Every show I've been on with you, I've used my normal mic, and I'm sitting there going, it just won't kick into life. Backup plan, let's just grab the gaming headset and rock it out. If it's good enough for Call of Duty, it's good enough for quite well, frankly. Well, listen, it sounds, it, sounds be- it sounds amazing. So if it doesn't, if it's not broke, don't fix it. But you sound great right now. And I, again, thank you for everything, man. And uh, I'll, I'll talk to you after the show, and we have to do a second installment of this in, in some kind of a way uh, to keep up because I think that the next phase is going to be very digital, and it's going to be great to have you uh, your, your thoughts on things as we go along. Oh, there, there's many hags coming. Um, I, I, you know, it's great to have a good refresher, and I started digging into so many different things that are going on right now. And yes, Anonymous is back. They're not using the IRC anymore. It's it's all on you know like Signal and a couple other platforms I'd never heard of till today. Um, but yeah, it's going to be an interesting uh, year. I have a good feeling about that. We'll be discussing some big hacks this year. Well, a good feeling. We'll see good results, bad results. It doesn't matter. The rest of us are just observers. We don't know what the hell's going on. But I figure I'd ask somebody who does, and thanks for the time, my friend. Have a good night. I appreciate everybody who stuck it out through the technical difficulties. And um, I was on earlier, like your caller said, uh, promoting the show and telling everybody, (laughs) um, you know, how freaking awesome you are so i'm glad you know you guys stuck it out and um i will always promote your show man i well, love you mean you. it dude all right have a good one man thank you all so right, much appreciate it yeah i listen every night that uh every night that that jim's on the show it's usually a night that i i walk i walk out of here uh looking over my shoulder and i don't know we got a lot there got a lot there got more than i bargained for to be honest because i just Wanted to get the uh, like a little bit of a psychological profile of uh, of what's going on, which if any of us have been hanging out on the internet for any good period of time, then these are all things that were happening. I I don't know how to do any of this stuff, but we all saw the videos, we all read about the hacks, we read about the PlayStation thing. Um, obviously, we talk about Benghazi a lot, and but that's that's why I wanted to. You know, double back on that a little bit there, too, because there's so many gigantic things going on in the entire region of the world, not just in Libya. So um, uh, in in that chaos many years ago, I'm sure that people like Jim were able to uh, to get a little bit more of a of a glimpse that nobody else would get from a a, a cyber standpoint. But damn, got a lot there. If this video resonates with you, leave me a comment because I love hearing from you all. First time here? Be sure to subscribe and click the bell. Yeah! Remember, it would be impossible for me to do this without your support, so please join my Patreon or buy me a coffee on PayPal. And always, attack ideas, not people.